to community. We are so glad you've decided to join us for worship today. If this is your first time with us, be sure to click the link next to I'm New and let us know you're joining us so we can follow up with you later. If you are a regular at community, be sure to click the link to let us know you're here and go ahead and sign our online guest book. You know, some of you have asked how you can support the church during this time. You can give online by going to cccks.org forward slash give and follow the instructions there. Or you can mail in a check to the address up on your screen. Again, thank you for worshiping with us today. Let's enter into worship. between us by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive
We're here this morning with Scott Anderson. Scott is a uh, member of our Community Covenant Church family. He's also a business person in our community. He and his wife, Missy, own the uh, Tropical Smoothie franchises here in our area. And uh, Scott, we're glad to have you here this morning. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit of what you do, a little bit about your business. And Yeah, uh, well, thank you, David. Thank you for having me today and best wishes to everyone out there. Um, yeah, so Missy and I, we started this Tropical Smoothie Cafe business here in Lenexa in 2014 into 15. And uh, I would say Missy's really the, she's the chief operating officer. Um, I'm helping with marketing and some finance things mm -hmm. and things, but she's really the one that really drives it daily. Part of us wanting to do this was, you know, to have a, uh, if you will, a local business, have a business between us and our family. And uh, so, yeah, we really appreciate um, the support from Community Covenant Church, and we're still learning and living every day. So. Yeah. And how many employees do you have in your franchises? We typically uh, have 50 or 60 people among the three cafes. Yeah. So obviously, as a, a small business owner, um, the coronavirus pandemic is obviously impacting you. Why don't you just share a little bit about that and, and talk a little bit about uh, what is it that, uh, uh, that keeps you up at night? What weighs okay. heavy on your heart? Through, through these difficult times. Yeah, no, this is, this is good. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really interesting month, uh, almost to the date, uh, going back mid-March when we started by canceling, uh, well, re seeing the news and canceling spring break mm -hmm. and understanding we need to be real close to the business. Um, and then of course the early days, not really knowing, a lot was in the unknown in terms of how long, um, what does it mean? We saw revenues effectively collapse so now you're thinking through all kinds of different things. So you spend a lot of time just thinking and planning and just realizing that on any hour, any announcement can just change anything. Um, there's days that you're in despair just because you don't really see much of hope. Mm -hmm. And then there's days that you, you actually have a bit of hope. And you, we learned kind of after the four or five first days that you just kind of ride it, that you just have to roll with what's going on, um, not only to our business, but our communities and, and you know, whole society overall. Yeah, and the people you, the people who you are close to as your employees. Absolutely, people we depend on and obviously their welfare and you're just trying to weigh all that into a balance. And you realize you get to the point that you find out there's more that is out of your control than it is in your control. Um, so I'd say that represents the first spell of not being able to sleep because usually you just try to think and plan a way out and it's just much bigger than that. And, and obviously whether they're, you know, a business owner like you or uh, your employees who maybe aren't you know, overseeing the business, but they still, they struggle with sleeping too at night and uh, they struggle with the worry and the anxiety that uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of us are experiencing at this time. As, as, you're, as you've gone through this, what, what is it that God is showing you? What is it that God's yeah. teaching you, speaking into you? you know, why don't you share a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, it, and, you know, we all like to think that we're in faith and we're building in faith and we're, you know, serving the Lord and mm -hmm. working, living for the Lord. But I, I will say that the paradigm is so much different. Like I mentioned, just trying to be in control or thinking mm -hmm. we're in control. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether we're believers or we're not there yet in our belief, I think we've all had a sense of taking back, meditating, seeing what's going on around us. Um, I, I, in my age, I grew up in a society that we, we were able to solve things mm. through might or economics or just the United States of America. And I think people are getting a sense it's much bigger than this. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's, it's drawn on a lot of prayer. When I really get to a point of despair, I, I can't solve it. 
I flip over to the Lord, just mm. saying trust and trust in Him, counting on Him, and uh, trying to revolve my faith around that, as well as it's a time to understand where we're still blessed. And I think it's, an under, it's a time that we can think of other peoples that are suffering greater than we are. Mm. Well, thanks for sharing, because a lot of what you're talking about and how you're dealing with it is going to really tie in with a sermon series, a message series that we're beginning uh, this morning uh, called God Will Make a Way. And over these next five weeks, we're going to be looking at the story from Exodus 14, where uh, God's people are released from slavery in Egypt and they come to the Red Sea. And they have the sea in front of them, they have mountains around them, and the Egyptian army's coming up behind them. And, uh, and, and they're in despair, and they're anxious, and they're fearful. They don't know what the future's going to hold. And there are some great lessons that we're going to learn out of Exodus 14 uh, these five weeks. And, and uh, for those of you who uh, uh, would want to uh, follow along through these next weeks with a companion book that we're going to be recommending that you read over these weeks, uh, we want to encourage you to take a look e- and, and uh, purchase the book. It's a small book called The Red Sea Rules, uh, 10 uh, strategies, that God, 10 God-given strategies uh, in difficult times. And that's going to be a companion book that we're going to use uh, during our series, and you can get that for about $2 on Kindle. Uh, Pastor Tom told me you can download that for about $2 uh, that way, or you, it's about $5 or so uh, that you can purchase otherwise. And So I want to encourage you to uh, get that book if you can, and uh, be a part of this series uh, as we begin it today and in the next several weeks. Thanks, Scott, for being with us, and uh, blessings on you and Missy, and We'll be praying for you and uh, for her and for your employees and, and uh, for other business owners as well who are really facing some hard times through, through these days. Thank so, you, David. But thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. So in light of all the uncertainties that we face, that we just heard, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, during this time that we, we just don't have all the answers and we don't know the future, God, but you are the one who leads us. So God, help us to keep our eyes on you when we falter, when we struggle, when we question. Help us to remember, God, that you walk with us. You walk before us. You're blazing a trail even through the chaos that is our lives. And God, center us around your word. So God, we join our hearts with those around the world who pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out He's working all things out
His world was in ruins. He is anxious. He is fearful. He's tossing and turning at night. He can't sleep. And finally, in the middle of the night, he gets up and he starts reading his Bible. And his mind goes back to the story of Exodus 14, where, where God's people were up against it. And yet, in the midst of them being up against it, God makes a way for them through the difficult time. They have the sea in front of them. They have the mountains on each side of them. And coming up behind them are the armies of Egypt who are chasing after them. And and reading that story again, that story that was so familiar to him, this man who we know today as Asaph, the man who was a worship leader in the temple in the time of King David in the Old Testament, in, in the midst of the fear and the anxiety, he writes Psalm 77. And he begins by saying, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long, I prayed with my hands lifted to heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. Is this where you find yourself today as we face the COVID-19 pandemic? Is this where you find yourself as we really are facing three pandemics, the coronavirus pandemic, but also the financial pandemic that has resulted from it, as well as the social pandemic of anxiety and fear. Could this be a defining moment in your life and mine? What is the defining moment of your life? Now, I know that's, that's an interesting question. You might be like, a defining moment? I can't even think of one. Or maybe you can think of one. Maybe it's super clear in your mind. Or maybe it's more like a few tiny moments that made all the difference. Or maybe it just hasn't happened yet. And while we might have a hard time coming up with our defining moment, if you grew up Jewish, then the defining moment in the history of your people would be the Exodus. And the Exodus is this monumental event that would shape the identity of God's people in the Old Testament, and it would come to deeply inform the dynamic of their relationship between them and God. But in the moment while that was happening, the Exodus sort of seemed like a disaster. I mean, picture this. You're walking out of Egypt with thousands of other Israelites, and it's just the unknown. It's just the wilderness. And it wasn't very long before Pharaoh kind of came to his senses and said, wait a minute, I just let the basis of my entire economy just walk out the front door without any resistance. And so in a short amount of time, it wasn't just that the Israelites were walking out into the unknown and into the wilderness, but now they have their oppressors. This major world power that's been dominating them for 400 years, now they're hot on their heels on this journey. And if you read into Exodus chapter 13 and 14, you can almost feel the anxiety of God's people. And even though God is there reassuring them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, you can see that they are getting restless. And can you blame them? These are people who have run their lives for 400 years, and they're chasing them. And as you read through the passage, eventually God tells them to turn back, to set up camp. I mean, if we're watching an action movie, you've ever seen an action hero who's in a car chase? Just pull into the drive through of your local McDonald's and leisurely order a meal and, and sit down and rest as someone's chasing them? No, it's frantic. But Exodus 14 is no action movie. God is working behind the scenes in this narrative. He's intentionally leading his people to a place where only he can save them. At the end of Exodus 13, we see God leading his people right up to the sea. 
And it reads in verse 21, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piharoth, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite from Baal Zephon. He led them into a, what seemed like a trap. There's the sea, there's the mountains, there's the Egyptian army. He leads them to a place where there's no other way to explain how they are rescued than God. Than God showing up. He gives the people no option but for his people to just trust that God knows what he's doing. And at that point, they weren't too sure about that. And could you imagine being in the middle of those excruciating moments? I mean, the Red Sea is there and it's taunting them. They see the mountain ranges and that deflates them. And they see this army and that's terrifying them. And they find themselves just in this enormous trap. And they think it's over. But God is setting everything up for a big reveal. He's writing the chapter of this redemption story, and this is going to be their defining moment. The Exodus, this moment would be the signpost of God's faithfulness. But as they were experiencing it, the only thing that the Israelites could see is disaster. It looked like God was at best a phony, not worthy of their trust. And at worst, some kind of twisted masochist that just tempted them with freedom only to set them up for the slaughter. From their vantage point, they were doomed. And if the story was just about the people, if the Israelites were the main character in the story, then they might have been right. But you know, the story that God writes it's never just about us. God is always the main character. God's writing his story, and he invites us to participate in the story, but, but he is both the author and the primary character. In Exodus 14, chapter 14, verse 4, it says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Did you catch that? The whole point of setting up this situation is so the Egyptians, the enemies, would know that he is God, that he is in charge. He's making a point. Pharaoh had made himself up to be a god, and he had positioned himself to be the ruler, and God's saying, no. No, I am the Lord. I am in charge. So the Egyptians, the slave masters, the oppressors, the villains of the story, this whole situation, this whole sequence of events is making a point to them. And it's not even really for God's people, although obviously this makes a huge impact because they celebrate the Passover and they, they, they remember the Exodus for years to come. But God's making the point that he is in charge, period. And, it, and the Egyptians' dominance over God's people is coming to an end. He's about to do something unfathomable, unbelievable. But all the Israelites could see was water, mountains, and armies. You know, if you really think about it, not a whole lot has changed in a few thousand years, has it? It's so easy for us to wonder where God is in times of our struggle, in times where we, we don't know what to do, when we find ourselves being anxious, and we wonder if we've, we've misplaced our trust in God. We wonder if it's really worth it. When we find ourselves in these painful situations, we, we wonder, well, how do we end up here? And how could a good God want us to camp in this miserable place? But could it be that God is preparing a way through so that he can once again show us that he is the Lord? Could it be that God is using our situation, this coronavirus pandemic, 
as an opportunity to show us something about who God is? As we set up camp, and we call it sheltering in place, could it be that God is writing a story of redemption that will be the defining moment in the story of Christianity, of the modern-day church? Could it be that we'll write our own songs and stories about the coronavirus pandemic, and they won't just be songs of lament, they won't just be songs of struggle, but could it be that we'll actually look back at this moment and we'll write stories of celebration, celebration of God's faithfulness? Could it be that you are exactly where you're supposed to be at this very moment? See, the red story wasn't the end of the story of God's people. Throughout that moment, even after they crossed the Red Sea, people still got it wrong. They still messed up. They still had other adversity that they had to face. And you know what? More often than not, they got it wrong they would always look back to that moment. They'd always look back to the Exodus. Before they could, could experience that amazing miracle of walking through the Red Sea with these, with these walls of water around them, they had to set up camp. They had to set up camp in a hopeless situation. They had to wait while the whole world looked like it was caving in on them. The Lord was preparing to make a way through, but not yet. Not until the timing was just right. So that the only explanation when God would deliver them is that he is the Lord. Going back to Asaph, who is struggling with what's going on in his world, he thinks back to the story that Tom just talked about. The story of God's people at the Red Sea and Like the Israelites of old, he had to be thinking, wow, is God going to come through? What's going to happen here? In fact, in Psalm 77, verse 10, he says, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. But then he says, I recall all that you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. O oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. For your strong, by your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Your road led through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along that road like a flock of sheep, with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. Asaph, in the midst of his anxiety and the fear of what is going on in his world and his life at that time, remembers who God is, and he trusts God. And today we are in anxious and fearful times, and and it is a time of testing of our faith. It's a time of hardship and And our first reaction oftentimes is to worry, it's to be filled with anxiety. But I think we need to learn to look at the past like Asaph did. And to look at the scriptures and see all of the ways in which God has been there for his people through time. And so what's the takeaway of this story for us? Well, the takeaway is, as you see here on the screen, that The first step toward making God making a way in our life is to frequently remind ourselves that that the Lord has put us in this difficult place or has allowed us to be here for reasons that only he knows and that he will bring glory to his name. He'll bring good out of it. You know, I think back to my dad and my mom and and how my dad and mom near the end of his ministry uh, He was retiring and looking forward to being able to spend a a number of retirement years together with my mom, doing things that that they hadn't been able to do through the years in which he was involved uh, in his ministry. And a month after my dad retired, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, and a few months later, she was gone. And, And in moments like that, you and I will ask why. Why? 
And, and, and when I do, I know that God reminds me of Romans 8.28 that tells me that God is going to work good things out of the bad that happens in our life. Uh, Romans 8.28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. You know, I remember my dad saying at my mom's funeral that God makes no mistakes. <laughs> Was he saying that God caused my mom's premature death? No. No, instead what he was saying is what the Bible says is that God is not the author of evil, but God can take bad things that happen and work them for good in your life and mine. And so like Asaph, I believe we need to look at how God has worked in the past and how God continues to work and, and see all the ways in which God has been faithful and has come through. If you are watching online today and you're one who doesn't have a relationship with God, I, I pray that God will use this in your life. God is using this in all kinds of ways to impact people who, who, who don't know him. As, as we're being told that uh, the spike in, on Google in terms of people searching words like church and God and prayer... Uh, has, has just risen dramatically. And, and the Version Bible app uh, has had a lot of people over this last month who have signed up and are now starting to do devotional plans and reading God's word. It, it, the reality is, is that people are not turning away from God in this time, but they are turning toward God. And the opportunities for that uh, are there for us as we go through this hard time. And God is saying to us that if we will put our trust in him and we will look to him, he can work good out of even the bad things that are happening during this time. He's wanting us to trust him and trust that he will work for his glory, just as Jesus did in that story that, we, uh, that we've been looking at and that we've heard these last couple of weeks during the Easter season, that, that story that began on Palm Sunday when Jesus went into Jerusalem and he began that week-long journey to the cross. And that night before he went to the cross, the Bible tells us he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was in great agony emotionally and, and inside struggling as he knew what was going to happen. And in John 12, it tells us he, he prays, uh, he prays, Father, should I be praying that you would save me from this hour? In a sense, what he's saying, and, and he says, no. He says, no. He says, your will be done. God, would you use this to bring glory to your name? And God did. As God used Jesus' suffering to offer forgiveness and grace and a relationship with him for those of us who, who were separated from God by our sin, by the wrong stuff we've done in our life. And God used that, that terrible thing, and he worked it for good, and he worked it for his glory. And so can we, in the midst of what we are struggling with, in the midst of what we are facing today, be like Jesus and say, not our will but yours, O God. Would you use this for your glory? And know that if we will, and we will trust him, God will will make a way. God will make a way for you and for me. Your glory is so beautiful.